Welcome to the Nukipedia podcast for the Ides of March 2023. After some news, we'll have Lehman's reign taking us through the rise of Caesar Sallow in the Fallout history, and then Ellis is going to introduce us to some Swamp Men in Creature Feature. Then, lastly, Mandy joins us from 13, a Fallout podcast retelling the story of the original Fallout. But first, a short news break. <laughs> Nukipedia Network News, I'm Agent C. We have a new release date for Starfield, it's 5 September 2023, with the Starfield Showcase on June 11. Can you wait? Will you be playing? Or will you stick to being in the vault? Our affiliates on the Memory Den Wiki are running a Fallout fanfic contest. Entries must be in by March 29. This contest theme is the New California Republic, and I can't wait to see what you've all come up with. That guy with a Game Boy camera has returned with another documentary detailing his quest leaving snow globes around the real Las Vegas with some real Fallout voice actors showing up along the way. You'll find that on YouTube, or check him out on Twitter, at that guy with a GA1. And our friends at the 5.0 have added the new Fallout Mayor of Flatwoods quest that you can play along with. No party required. Visit fallout50.com slash you to get that started. This is your Nukipedia Network News. If you have news for us, email nukafalloutwiki at gmail.com, or tweet at Nukipedia. And lastly, just before we go... As an announcement, we have an extra Nukipedian of the Year Award winner for the Lifetime Achievement Award, which we are awarding to King Clyde in recognition of his many years that he led the wiki as bureaucrat, but passed away in the last year. Additionally, we've decided to name the award after him moving forward, so it will be known as the King Clyde Lifetime Achievement Award. And now to Layman's Reign, who gives us full out history. It's 2281, Fortification Hill overlooking the Colorado River. A courier from the Mojave Express is subjected to a lecture from what some consider to be perhaps the greatest military mind in the wasteland. Decades of warfare, absorbing lesser tribes, gathering power, forging the dross into a vast, razor-sharp scythe. My legion's expansion has never ceased. Much of the Utah and Colorado, and all of Arizona and New Mexico, are mine. We have cities of our own, but nothing compared to Vegas. Finally, my legion will have its Rome. But who is the man, this self-proclaimed Caesar, who hopes to bring the Roman Empire out of the history pages and back into reality, slamming the might of the bull against the NCR's bear? I'm Layman's Reign. Join us on Fallout History as we explore Edward Salo, the rise and fall of Caesar's legion. Edward Salo had perhaps the most unlikely origin story for what he became. He was not born of warring tribes or taught the ways of the warrior at an early age. Instead, he was born not far from the Los Angeles Boneyard, deep in the NCR territory. At age two, his recently widowed mother took work in a library serving the followers of the Apocalypse, a pacifist group that valued knowledge and humanitarianism. And the teaching stuck. I was taught it was my responsibility to bring the torch of knowledge to the wastes. I may have taken the torch part more literally than they intended. Sala was given the full benefit of being raised with the followers, learning to read, and in later years, trained in anthropology and languages. If you think it's worthwhile to make smart people learn how to talk like backward savages, you're a follower of the apocalypse. Or an idiot. As you can imagine, his temper and attitude did not win him many friends with the followers, despite his handsome features and athletic abilities. Although recognized as a bright child, his academic results were uneven, varying by his interest in the subject. Despite being known as the home of misfits, Salo himself felt he did not belong in the group. So it is perhaps a surprise that at age 20 he was selected as the linguist on a team destined to the Grand Canyon. Sources conflict as to if this was a team of two or nine, but they would soon be joined by another who would be instrumental in Salo's future, Joshua Graham. I traveled along the Long 15 and followed 89 south into Arizona. Along the way, I met two men from a group called the Followers of the Apocalypse, Edward Salo and Bill Calhoun. They came to teach the tribes. Calhoun was a good man. Edward was the one who got us into trouble down the road. Not long after this, the team was captured by the Blackfoot tribe, who intended to hold the team for ransom. This is the point where the progress of Salo's life would forever be changed. The Blackfoot were at war with seven other tribes, 
each just as pissant as they were. But outnumbered like that, they weren't going to last long. It's one thing to be taken hostage, another to be lashed to a sinking ship. So over Calhoun's objections, I decided to take certain steps. I taught them how to use the guns they already had, how to strip and clean them, how to breathe when pulling a trigger, how to reload ammunition. They looked at me like I was some kind of a sorcerer. So I taught them how to make explosives and started drilling them on small unit tactics. If there's anything I learned as a follower of the apocalypse, it's that there's a lot of good information in old books. Solo could not have strayed further from his roots. The pacifist son of a raider victim was now leading raiders, making them more effective. But Solo was not yet done. Many tribes would follow, their identities destroyed and their members absorbed into a new tribe. A single great tribe. A legion. I led the Blackfoot against the Ridgers, their weakest enemy. When they refused to surrender, I ordered every man, woman, and child killed. When next we surrounded the Kaibabs and they likewise refused... I took one of their envoys to the Ridger's village and showed him the corpse piles. This was new for the tribes, you see. They played at war, raiding each other, a little rape and pillage here, a little ransoming there. I showed them. Once it became large enough, Salo crowned himself Kaisar and sent Calhoun back to VNCR with a message that he should not be interfered with. Graham stayed with Salo, serving as his legatus, but still the Legion continued to grow until Salo turned his attention back to the West the new California Republic. No longer satisfied with simply being left alone, the Legion declared war on its leader's homeland. I'll destroy it because it's inevitable that it be destroyed. The NCR has all of the problems of the ancient Roman Republic. Extreme bureaucracy, corruption, extensive senatorial infighting. Just as with the ancient Republic, it is natural that a military force should conquer and transform the NCR into a military dictatorship. The Colorado River is my Rubicon. The NCR Council will be eradicated, but the new synthesis will change the Legion as well, from a basically nomadic army to a standing military force that protects its citizens and the power of its dictator. Skirmishes would follow with smaller battles and the destruction of an NCR fort eventually leading to the Battle of Hoover Dam. Caesar did not take the lead in this battle, and the limited ability of the Legion to adapt would draw them into a trap at Boulder City explosives taking out many of the most experienced troops. Caesar would have to set an example, and ordered his legate Graham to be burned alive and then thrown into the Grand Canyon. Caesar's temper was, at this point, becoming well known. But Caesar had finally found an enemy he could not beat into submission. Biology. His expressions had become more sullen, and he was beset by crippling headaches. He would lose normal ability to move his leg and blanked during conversations. All signs pointed to a brain tumor, and surgery would be needed, something that is not encouraged by the culture of a legion, who had turned their backs on medicine and life-improving technologies. And this is where the story of Salo begins to get unclear. It's unknown if he had the operation, or if he succumbed to the condition. But it is clear that he cannot live forever, nor is it clear if a legion could even survive without him, or if in his death the legion becomes something new, as the original Roman Republic became something new, with the death of Julius Caesar on March 15th, 44 BC. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Fallout Creature Feature, where we take a look at some of the most notable animals, monsters, and strange beings that inhabit the wasteland. I'm Ellis, and today we head south from the capital wasteland and into the mysterious and foreboding slice of countryside known as Point Lookout. The denizens of Point Lookout, collectively referred to as the Swamp Folk, are going to be our topic of discussion for today. The Swamp Folk are descended from the local inhabitants of the bogs of Point Lookout. Poor breeding habits and regular exposure to radiation has led to the Swamp Folk appearing hideously mutated and automatically hostile to any wary traveler who isn't a member of their clans. This behavior of defending their territory from any outsiders was even common among the Swamp Folk's ancestors before the Great War. 
The Swamp Folk display a significant amount of religious fervor. Their living structures decorated with straw dolls, bone totems, teddy bears, and mannequin heads. These objects serve two roles. One is to keep outsiders away. Another is the symbology of their belief system, one gained through exposure to the Black Hall cult. The Swamp Folk actually stole the evil tome known as the Krivbekne from Constance Blackhall, and now use it as part of their ritual site in order to carry out their sacred activities. Even though Point Lookout itself wasn't hit directly by nuclear bombs, the radioactivity can be seen throughout the area and among the local population. This combination, along with decades of inbreeding, have left the Swamp Folk intellectually stunted and easily agitated. Traditionally, Swamp Folk will attack their victims in groups of two to five, most commonly, the groups will utilize a melee fighter who charges in, with two firearms users providing support. Interestingly, while they normally attack any outsiders on site, the Swamp Folk will not be violent towards the non-mutated population of Point Lookout, sometimes referred to as Marsh Folk. These people include Kenny, Marguerite, Obadiah Blackhall, and Haley, who actually has a regular trading arrangement with the Swamp Folk. Unlike feral ghouls and super mutants, it is much easier to tell Swamp Folk apart, based on appearance. The various Swamp Folk are the Brawler, Bruiser, Creeper, Scrapper, and Tracker. Brawlers, Creepers, and Scrappers are all capable of utilizing firearms. Bruisers and Trackers, on the other hand, are only able to use melee weapons such as axes. This is because their hands and fingers have swollen to such a degree that it would be impossible for them to get their hands around or utilize the triggers for firearms. Something to keep in mind about the Swamp Folk is their incredible durability. They may not look like a great threat, but don't be fooled. They're among the most powerful enemies found in the wastes. Brawlers can be equated with super mutant brutes when it comes to durability. Trackers can withstand more punishment than sentry bots or death claws. Scrappers, the smallest and weakest of the Swamp Folk, with the least amount of mutations on their bodies, have more health than regular super mutants. Creepers, who have the same body structure as Scrappers, are more durable than Super Mutant Masters. An unarmed attack from a Bruiser yields more damage than a Deathclaw Strike. Basically, if you're venturing into Point Lookout, make sure that you have enough ammunition, because you'll most definitely need it. The Swamp Folk serve as a terrible reminder that the Great War affected the entire planet, not only the major targets. The Great War shaped the Earth at large, and those consequences are still being felt by local populations, even 200 years after the fact. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fallout Creature Feature. For the Nukipedia Pipcast, I'm L.S. So I'm with Mandy from 13, an upcoming Fallout podcast. Thanks for joining us there, Mandy. Thank you for having me. So normally I ask everyone first up if they're an old fan or a new fan or something in between. Obviously, you do have some appreciation for the originals with a name like 13. How did you start? And was it with the older or was it with the newer games? My first Fallout game, believe it or not, was actually Fallout Shelter on the uh, mobile phone. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> and, um, and I... Got into that, and I was like, oh, this is really neat. I'm going to look up more about it. And at that point, I think 4 had just come out, and I didn't have a PS4 yet. So I was like, well, I'll just get the one before that. So after Fallout Shelter, I started with 3. And after that, I was just like, okay, I've got to play all of them now. So it just, you know, went down the line from there. So after 3, did you move up to 4, or did you go back down to 1 and 2? It was a while before I played 1 and 2. I think I had finished all of the more current games before I went back to so one and two, but I really enjoyed them. And I, I know they're different and that's not everybody's thing, but I really enjoyed them and their story and, and, you know, the beginning of everything. Awesome. So you didn't find the transition too uncomfortable then? No, I've played so many different kinds of games that I think I was just like, okay, this is something different and roll with it. So yeah, I didn't have too much of a problem there. Fair enough. What's the scope of your project? Are you doing a straight retelling of Fallout 1 or are you taking a bit more of creative license and exploring things not yet seen on screen? I think the project like this, you kind of 
need to use a little creative license just because you're trying to make a script as opposed to just a quest list. The overall story is the same, but you kind of have to flesh things out. And that's where you get to know the characters a bit better than you do in the games. And how do they get from point A to point B? That's usually off screen. So there is that creative license in there, but it's the basic outline of the story of Fallout 1. Awesome. So I can see from the casting calls that you made that you're going with the canonical Albert Cole as your narrator and Vault Dweller. Can you describe your version of the Vault Dweller? Who are they? Where, where did they sort of come from and where do they sit on the karmic scale? So Albert Cole, for those who don't know, is the kind of diplomatic character preset for Fallout 1. So he's like, you know, charisma nine, very intelligent. And so I kind of wanted to go that route. And in my initial planning for the story, I kind of looked at him as a witty Han Solo kind of character. But as I started to write, it kind of switched and became this naive but eager young man who's ready to explore the surface that he's heard so much about. You know, he's always curious about what's going on around him and asking questions. And he solves his problems with words instead of weapons when he can. And so it just changed from that initial kind of idea that I had and evolved into something else. You know, he's always trying to do the right thing and he's young and experienced and the world is rough and he kind of has to learn that and it can change a person. So we'll see a growth, a hero's growth over the course of the story. Okay, so it sounds like you're sort of going for a sort of more good version of the character. Is that fair to say? <laughs> yes. And he's definitely, I guess you would call that very good or remember which one is the fallout top tier. But, you know, as I say, it might, he might go down a different route at some point and kind of become more of what Elder Albert as our narrator telling the story of, of his you know, youth. And so we get to kind of see how the Albert we meet from Fallout 13 becomes this Elder Albert and how he's changed over the progress of his life. Okay, so is it a bit like the opening of the Fallout 2 manual then? A bit, yeah. I did take inspiration from that and from both manuals, actually. And so it is, it is very much that, you know, him telling his story and so we get that book end at the beginning and then we jump into Fallout 1. So what's the biggest challenge you've had in production so far and what would you suggest to other budding creators to deal with challenges like that? I think figuring out how to include as many quests as I could without story becoming bloated. You want to have as much of the original content as you can, but there comes a time where you have to kind of look at it and say, I want to include this, but I don't think that's going to work in the context of the story. One of the quests that I did cut was Neil's Urn quest in Junktown. And I was like, this is a great story, but I don't feel like it fits for the character at this at this current time. So you kind of just have to look at it and say, this is where I'm going at this point. And, you know, things might, as you write, things kind of evolve and change. And so at a later time, you can go, well, maybe I can fit this in that I didn't think I could. I and mean, that's probably the advice that I would have for other creators in that kind of situation is make an outline, make a list of the things you have to include. And then another list where it's things I want to include, but I'm not sure about if they're going to fit in yet. And that way, as the story goes, you can kind of evaluate as you get to that point, which way do I want to go? Awesome. So what's the thing you're most excited for in the show? Necropolis is going to be game-changing for Albert. It's going to be something that changes Albert's outlook. I can't wait to hear it. So part of what we try and do in this series is try and spotlight other creators. What other creators big and small, have, have helped inspire your work and who should we try and get, give a bit more attention to? Lawrence from the Modus Files, he brought me into the world of Fallout podcasting and has always supported me in whatever I'm doing at the time. I really appreciate him and, and the work he's done and the work that he's allowed me to do for him. So I always plug him where I can. And also Brad from Once Upon a Wasteland. He is fantastic at giving good advice on how to, you know, approach things, you know, whether it be writing or the audio, or he's just a really good source of information and he gives that so willingly, but they're both yeah. just such amazing creators. Yeah. By the time you hear this out there, we, we'll have just had Brad on a previous show. Awesome. So what are the best ways to follow the work? Right now, the best place is going to be Twitter. It's F-O-13, so F-O-T-H-I-R-T-E-E-N. If you follow the, the Twitter, we will definitely have the latest news on the releases, and any casting calls that we have for later episodes. Great. Thanks very much for joining us there, Mandy, and we are looking forward to hearing it. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Great.